Hello, everybody, and welcome to the University of Queensland's Faculty of Health and Behavioural Sciences alumni webinar series. My name is Paul Purcell, and today we'll be joined by Professor Nancy Bahana from the UQ School of Psychology and Debbie Britton from the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. Today, Nancy and Debbie will discuss the art and dementia program that's going ongoing and explain how UQ is leading the way as an age-friendly university. We invite you to let us know where you're joining us from today. Feel free to do so in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Also, if you want to ask questions throughout the webinar, that's very much encouraged. Feel free to use the same function there, and then we'll endeavour to get to those towards the end of the presentation. I begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the various different lands on which we all meet. On behalf of the university, I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. This webinar is being recorded. So for the, for if you have colleagues or friends who aren't able to join us, an email will be sent around early next week with the link, as well as any further information that comes out of today's session. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce firstly, Professor Nancy Pahana. Thank you very much, Paul. And I'm so pleased to be here today with my colleagues from the Queensland Art Gallery. And this is our inaugural talk in the faculty showcasing uh, UQ's new role as an age-friendly university, the first age-friendly university in the Southern Hemisphere. To become an age-friendly university, UQ had to make an application. And part of the application was showing how we met certain criteria in best practice in research and reaching out to older adult communities. And one of the key points was, how do we reach out in terms of culture? How do we reach out in terms of making quality of life and well-being better for older adults? And I can't think of a better way that that's uh, being uh, implemented than the program on art and dementia at the Queensland Art Gallery. So let me introduce our speaker for today, Debbie Britton. Debbie Britton joined the Queensland Art Gallery's learning team in 2002. And in 2014, the museum learning team's focus on lifelong learning and access for all abilities saw the first art and dementia program kickoff within the gallery's suite of access programs. As project officer, Debbie coordinates the art and dementia program as part of her education officer role. The Art and Dementia program broadened its format and audience reach in 2018 as a result of a generous sponsorship support to enable additional social and sensory based elements of the program to be incorporated. Debbie integrates learning and evidence based practice drawn from her University of Tasmania Bachelor of Dementia Care Studies, where she's a final year student. And it's Debbie's both her commitment to the Art and Dementia program as well as her deep knowledge about the research and best practice interventions in art and dementia that allows for the strong partnership between UQ, the museum, and an expanding partnership into um, the health and hospital system here in Brisbane. So I'll turn over to Debbie now and let her give us her talk. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you to Paul and thank you, Nancy, for those introductions and, um, and thank you so much for the invitation to be here and thank you everyone for joining us today. So today we're going to be talking about art and dementia. Um, I'm coming to you today live from the Queensland Art Gallery located on the banks of the beautiful Brisbane River on Turrbal and Yagara country and I'd like to also acknowledge your traditional custodians of the land where the gallery stands and also pay my respect to elders past, present and future. So I'm hoping today's uh, presentation will take you on a visual journey uh, to convey hopefully the essence of the art and dementia program that we run here at the gallery. The program has been designed specifically to support the well-being of visitors living with dementia as well as their care partners. It's really about keeping participants active in our normal community setting and also a program that aims to really enable those with dementia to be present in the moment. So let's commence. 
Um, I'm going to start off just quickly by talking about how the program evolved so that you get a sense of where art and dementia programs fit in the, the landscape of art museums. Uh, we'll, we'll meet some of our audience participants and also look at the very specific environmental and sensory aspects that really underpin our program format here. And hopefully, uh, after we look at the format, we might have about four or five minutes left that I can take you actually on a tour today here at the gallery. So art museums, the evolution of the art and dementia programs in the landscape of global art museums. Really, uh, we've got art and dementia programs happening all around the world and all around Australia actually right now. But going back to 2007, the Museum of Modern Art in New York really was the benchmark for museum programs for visitors with dementia. And their Meet Me program um, has been a very successful program for those of, of us working in galleries to really, to really look towards and, and gain information from. So uh, they reached out through some generous sponsorship into other countries of the world, uh, Japan and Europe, as well as wider museum access in the USA and Australia uh, to offer their knowledge and expertise uh, to those who need to, needed to really get on board with offering um, dementia friendly or dementia accessibility programming in their art museums. In 2007, um, the National Gallery of Australia here in Canberra were lucky enough to join into that um, sharing of knowledge and they started to run a pilot program in Canberra, um, an art and dementia program specifically for visitors and care partners with dementia or their care partners. So that was a quite a successful um, start into the world of, of programming in art museums for visitors with dementia. And they actually ran um, a research evaluation study with uh, McPherson and colleagues in 2009. And, People are still citing this research actually. And uh, one of the main um, points I wanted to bring from that research was that the program or the research highlighted the ability, as you can read on the screen there, of um, psychosocial programs, which can maximize the residual capacities of the, the lo loss of um, cognitive function in people with dementia. So that's really inspiring. And um, so based on that, they've continued their program other art galleries around Australia have got programs running. And let's just focus now here in Brisbane on the Queensland Art Gallery where we have a suite of access programs but, but did not have anything for people with dementia. In 2011, uh, I got a call from a lady working in the Wesley uh, Mission Respite Day Centre and she'd heard about the Meet Me program in New York and was really keen to see what we were doing here for, for um, visitors. So we had to really pick up um, the speed and got on board with accessing that amazing um, digital content on the, on the MoMA website and really kicked off our very first art and dementia program here um, in, in Brisbane. And we really continued on on an on request basis as we gathered our own knowledge, drew on the, the information from the Canberra um, experience as well which uh, then got us to 2014. So six years ago, uh, we introduced our very first regular program, which we called our Art and Dementia program. Uh, we took little baby steps and slowly our, our wings have spread. And uh, four years later in 2018, as Nancy mentioned, we had uh, some very generous um, donors come on board. And I was really waiting for that opportunity to I knew exactly where we had to go next, I suppose I wanted to say with that extra support and drew on some really fantastic evidence-based research uh, to, to implement some grassroots additions to our component, which was the format of introducing increased socialization by having a cafe experience at the very start when people arrive for the program in the morning. Um, and also we knew our CBD location would potentially be a barrier for those to get to our program. So we were able to use um, the opportunity to book return taxi to people's residences or uh, organise a prepaid car park right beneath the gallery to, to reduce that barrier of, of access um, financially as also, and also uh, through mobility. And um, that uh, opportunity has really led to the fact that uh, we've had people 
who are able to stay in the program for longer. Um, and it also helps the care partner reduce the stresses and anxieties of the very busy day of, of getting the person here or ready to come to the program. They can just arrive and um, relax, reorientate and, and have a social experience that's not too, too much extra outside of their regular uh, caring responsibilities. So we also were able to, um, I was able to source some dementia accessible seating, which was um, an interesting journey, but you'll see some images of those coming up and it's been, they've been great um, to be able to assist people who have those mobility issues with um, leveraging up and down out of seating, for example, as their condition um, progresses. And then here we are in 2020, the world of COVID hit and uh, we closed our gallery for about four months and um, I'm very excited and proud to say that the first on-site program, the non-virtual experience um, really was led uh, by our Art and Dementia program because the format fitted so perfectly uh, within our COVID safe plan. And so we've been having our programs wrapped back on site here since mid July and our aged care residences and our day respite groups have been with us again since October. So we're looking at probably um, running through now till mid in December with the program. So here's a little bit of information about our program's uh, audience base. So over the years, we've had the, the opportunity to reflect on and also change things as we go, uh, learning from our experiences. So it's kind of landed us into three streams now. So the program is only small in size, which is very important for people with dementia to ensure that everybody in that group can have a voice. You know, so often uh, people with dementia are marginalized and will withdraw from situations when they're not given that opportunity. So keeping the group small enables each of the people with dementia to have a say if they'd like to, and uh, their care partners come along as well. We have our, our participants with dementia sitting in the front row. Um, they are steering the program for us. They're steering the conversation in the direction that they want to take it in. And we have the care partner sitting right behind um, who are there to support and, and, and sometimes participate as well in the conversation. We've got our community program. We've got individuals who are living in the community at home coming along or maybe loved ones are uh, bringing their, their parents or, or friends from aged care for, for our morning program with us. So they fit into our community program. We've also got two group programs. One, we run for residential aged care um, facilities and they book their own program. And also we have a stream for day respite groups and also dementia community support groups like younger onset dementia community groups, for example. So Graham and colleagues did some research in, um, in Austria in 2013, and they really picked out some interesting facts that really probably helped me and our, our, um, our team and those who come on the program understand why looking at the art in our art museum can elicit such amazing cognitive responses and uh, engagement um, for participants with dementia. And, and really when we stop and, and, and look at a piece of art, it, there is no right or there's no wrong uh, about how you might experience that moment with that piece of art. So it seems to tap into people with dementia's ability to be engaged, but also sustain their attention. And with the sustained attention, we find that there's improvements in, in other cognitive domains, for example, as um, they become more alert and sometimes um, their verbal communication can be spontaneous, but also improve as we move through the, the duration of the program. Here you can see me in the Australian collection at the Queensland Art Gallery. We've got our pretty well COVID uh, safe setting in place here. Um, this was taken a few months ago, this image. And we can see those dementia accessible chairs, which really provide the armrest for leveraging. Um, they needed to be mobile so I could move them from um, location to locations, store them, stack them, um, have a, of a weight of up to about 120 kilograms, I believe they hold. They're very comfortable chairs with padding. And it's really improved, I think, uh, the people with dementia's ability to to feel um, independent. And if they don't want to leverage up and down as we move, 
those wheels which have got brakes on the front and back casters actually enable them to just um, be moved along to the next location. Um, so this sort of thing was um, a journey because these types of um, seating arrangements um, really weren't, well, like for an art museum anyway, something that we had um, knowledge about or how to find. So it was really working with actually a company here in Brisbane uh, after looking widely um, on something that might be suitable for, to meet our needs here in the gallery. As well, of course, importantly, those with dementia. So the sensory and tactile prompts are really important to be able to engage those with dementia. Um, to really understand um, what we are exploring and to enable them to draw into, into their own personal experiences and their own um, thoughts so that they might be able to share uh, and communicate um, their um, appreciation of, of what they're doing at that time, moment in time. So we draw on things like flowers, um, perfume of flowers, the touch of flowers, um, the colours of our materials. We use really good quality paper for our art making as well. So we, um, I'm going to take you here to an example of, of a very iconic painting called Monday Morning by Vida Leahy, where we look at a narrative in a painting and see what we can pull out potentially in a tactile prop. And in this case, you can see the sunlight pure soap the lady who is scrubbing the clothes in her Monday morning duty of washing um, has got a, a cake of soap in her hand and we have these props ready so that if somebody can identify something within the narrative of the painting, we can draw out a prop and the sensory aspect of that beautiful, clean, lemony sunlight smell um, is something that takes people back to their childhood often and they can reminisce and uh, and talk about their own experiences or their own past chores or their own um, time with a family um, or relatives. And we then open up more further conversation about uh, people's individual um, personhood and uh, life experiences and preferences. Here we can see um, the soap. This was a pre-COVID image, by the way, but uh, We've had to sort of adapt to that um, environment, so like so many other people, and how we we run our format too. Uh, here we are in our gorgeous aesthetics of the Australian collection again, uh, looking at those really large scale works in a in a in a post COVID or a COVID life now, so that we can get that um, separation between people um, to keep everybody safe. But here we can see. Um, the participants really engaging with this gorgeous work called Under the Jacaranda by Godfrey Rivers. And this has been a very favorite artwork of ours lately because of the beautiful jacaranda season that we're experiencing here. And it really takes people back to their childhood uh, through reminiscence, but also to the lovely environments around them um, when they venture out of their four walls at home or their nursing home. And here we see our participant, here's Greg. Greg's been coming to our program for three years now, which is incredible. And um, so collecting, for me, collecting the flowers, the blooms from the jacaranda tree, bringing them in and letting people feel those gorgeous soft bluebell textures of the, of the bloom um, really does help people connect with that artwork in front of them. And, and also we invite at this time of the year any visitors to, to share those blooms underneath the jacaranda tree. Uh, and it really creates a fantastic atmosphere and each participant with uh, in our program are encouraged to, to share that in that experience in, a, in quite a normal setting and, and uh, contribute to this lovely array of, of blossoms that sit beneath the painting here in the gallery at the moment. So in 2018, when we had the injection um, of some funding through our donors, uh, as I mentioned before, I was able to include art making that accompanied the art viewing that we'd have been having in the program format for, for four years. And we really felt that, um, or we can see now that um, having that experience of, of continuing through the tactile and sensory opportunity through the art making and, and research also supports this to tell us that the participants uh, can continue to socialize. Um, their care partners certainly love that ability to socialize and, and, and draw on the, the therapeutic nature of, of making art. Uh, and we do find that that communication from that's been elicited, elicited from the very beginning in the art viewing experience 
does follow on into the art making and in fact the, the sustainment, um, the engagement in the activities really does um, increase that the communication and support for each other in the program. So people will be admiring other people's works, sharing materials, uh, and at the end when people put their name on their artwork and, and title their work and, and share their work, um, there's a sense of achievement and there's great joy and there's, there's great friendships that are developing through the art making as well. How's our gorgeous gallery environment? And I'm very proud to say that I take um, the best real estate within the building to share with our participants in the program. So here we are looking out towards South Bank with the Wheel of Brisbane and QPAC behind us. Uh, the water feature, very, very therapeutic and very relaxing, very stimulating. So if people don't want to engage in, in the themes within the paintings that they've seen in the art making, they certainly love engaging with those pelicans that are staring at them through this gorgeous, um, slightly tinted glass window. So here again, we can see the setup with the art making, lots of gorgeous materials, good quality materials, and lots of bright color and um, care partners are also encouraged to join in. However, it's really important that the person with dementia uh, really can do, uh, provide their own way of, of communicating through the art materials. So the program format, we've got a morning-based program. We know people with dementia um, are better in the mornings and so are their care partners as well. And they've got plenty of, a uh, lot more energy than what they might have later in the day. Gallery-based is really important uh, for our model because we really want participants to be in a community setting amongst the school kids coming through the gallery, within a cafe where people are having coffees and hearing the buzz of life going on around them. So uh, people come on site to our program, six people maximum with dementia plus their care partners. We start off in our cafe where the participants are invited to choose a drink of their choice. Uh, many of our residential aged care participants love choosing cappuccinos or lattes or things they haven't had to enjoy for a very long time and select a small bakery item to go with that. Um, there's great social experiences in this part of the program. Really, um, the next part is all these aspects that are really components of the building block to create the whole the holistic program that we provide. Uh, we move on to the art viewing for 30 minutes. I select two dementia accessible artworks and 15 minutes spent at each work. And then we move on to our 40 minute creative making activity that we just saw some images of there. So the, the core principles throughout our program is offering opportunities for reminiscence, validation and socialization. Everybody has a name tag. So we are always using people's names and validating someone's idea or opinion. Um, by using their name and affirming what they say. And this also can bring our participants back in to the moment um, as well. And it does also enable the socialization through sharing of information with each other. And we can see here that Greg is holding a copy of our artwork images, which we provide to, to each participant. Sometimes those who maybe can't engage with a painting for whatever reason on the day, uh, can use these images in front of them and it helps them connect with what they're seeing immediately in front of them, which with what's on the on the wall uh, on the canvas. So that's a great prop that we can use. But additionally, they take the image home with them at the end of the day. And on the back of the image is some information about the artwork in dementia friendly font, which is Arial 14. So they can read aloud or have it read to them or they can share their experience and artwork um, with their loved one later on as well. We try to mix things up. It's really important to have new learning experiences or new experiences like we all love to have in our lives. So people with dementia are treated no differently. And so we do often um, include contemporary works. Here we can see an installation by a New Zealand artist and Noble, Anne Noble that included uh, an active beehive. And um, we can see on the right hand side there uh, the artist engage with us by providing a 3D rendered uh, acrylic model of a bee and the uh, participants were able to, to have that in their hand and feel the texture of a bee which then connected them or assisted them to connect with 
those bees in the hive that they were so interested in seeing. And we had some beautiful black and white photography of, of the bee there alongside this artwork, which is part of Anne's installation. Here's, a, here's an example of how connecting in the gallery setting on the left-hand side with um, favourite place was a theme through artworks that we'd seen through some landscape paintings this day. And Greg um, went home and took this photograph, or his partner did, and sent it to me to show that he was really unable, although unable to maybe verbalise, because he has aphasia um, now um, quite severely, that through the artwork he could convey his message that this was his favourite place on his deck back home. Uh, you can see he loves the wattle trees in his backyard and he was sharing with us his love of, of his backyard and the colours of, of the wattle season. And uh, he titled his work Be There, B double E, there uh, because that tree, those wattle trees are full of bees and he loves the, the buzzing of the bees. And uh, you may find it interesting that uh, Greg was a, um, an environmental scientist. So often you see people's biographies coming through in, uh, in their appreciation of the program and what they see in the gallery. Uh, the Art and Dementia program has also given us a platform to enable people with dementia to be quite commonplace or seen regularly in the gallery setting and, and we've been able to embed um, the focus on people or visitors with dementia in our other programs. So when we have artist-led uh, opportunities and programming for our education audience, school groups and others, we do look at our access audience and make sure that our visitors with dementia can have a program with with an artist and 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 meet an artist and and have that engage that artist have the chance to engage with visitors with dementia. Um, it's it's a two way um, wonderful experience and and we're really proud that we can offer artist led programs for our participants with dementia at the gallery as well. Um, so again, Graham and colleagues really describe the aesthetic perception of art images or paintings as an island of stability. And I think we do see that in our program. It provides people with a chance to be just very present in what they're doing at that time. And um, it seems to break through any of that kind of clouding or cognitive disruption that is so frequently occurring in the daily lives of, of our visitors with or people with dementia. And it enables the care partner also, I think, to see their, their loved one in a, in a different way and puts them on a parallel platform um, for a portion of the day at least. And that brings a lot of joy for them and relief as well. Here we have a mother-daughter in uh, the program. And with our creative making, uh, just very quickly, we ensure we have a couple of options, not too many options, but a couple of options for, for the materials. It might be collage work they might like to work with or painting or watercolour crayons, for example. It enables the person to make a choice, so therefore they, it encourages their independence and, and autonomy, uh, which is extremely important for people with dementia. And we want them to maximize, maximize their, their ability and, and, and improve their socialization, and we don't wanna set them up to fail. We want them to be the best person that they possibly can also with us in the program. So we've got a few minutes. I'm gonna to have to really, I hope this isn't gonna to run too long, Paul, but I'm, I'm just hoping that I can at least let you have a little bit of a listen um, about um, and come on a, on, a, on a tour with us now that we've, we've heard all about it. I just thought you might like to, to come on a bit of a journey. And so, and so here we go. I'm just going to play um, uh, an excerpt from the ABC Radio National uh, Hub on Arts program. They came along to our program and captured this audio grab and played it on their, on their program. And, and I'd like to thank them for the opportunity to share this with you as well. Coming along to the gallery with a dementia-friendly group allows them to experience their love of art together, to connect the landscapes, the colors they see, with the places they've traveled to in the past. What do you like about it? Oh, I, really, it, it, it's, I love it. <laughs> yeah, um, 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 good, good um, art, and then, and, and, and some, uh, and then wouldn't see them. You wouldn't see them if it weren't for coming to yeah. this? Yeah. 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 In front of Morning Ride by the very well-known A 
Australian watercolorist, Kenneth McQueen. It's a depiction of a paddock in the Darling Downs, three kangaroos hopping through eucalyptus trees, a maple brown horse. What's the first thing that you noticed, Greg? seen it before yeah. and what's the first thing that you notice when you look at it yeah. the sweet yeah. so he sees the sweet yes so there's a beautiful sweep yeah. across the artwork yeah. this program's been so valuable for for Greg something to look forward to when they really encourage the people with dementia to talk and draw them out and they're also kind and he really looks forward to it, which is really good. Good break. We spend a good 15 minutes or so with Morning Ride. Sheila takes plenty of time to ask the group for their thoughts as they warm up and get comfortable and a bit more verbal. I meet Lisa, a lifestyle coordinator at an aged care facility. She's here as a chaperone. I've seen people over the years that have come and they've been quite shy and they've opened up every time they sit in front of a specific art piece that is familiar to them. I've seen some residents really express their thoughts about the art every time we come here and talk about it with their families as well after the tour. So I found specifically the colours is what brightens them up more. When we look at art with a lot of colour, they're able to express more. We move on to another room in the gallery, one that's a little bit noisier. We take our seats in front of a very colorful and very famous oil painting, Charles Blackman's The Blue Alice. And Lisa is right. The group is definitely responding to the vibrant hues. And we're going to look at the work. And again, I want you to think what I see. creep up to Barbara, who's in the early stages of dementia. She's studying the painting quite intently. It's blue background, Alice surrounded by white daisies, the white rabbit with its big eye looking right at us. White mouse, still mouse there. What do you think of this one? Very busy, very, very hard to do the amount of colour in it. Oh, the, the white outstanding on flowers is just so busy. It would take hours and hours. It wouldn't take probably him hours and hours. It would take me hours and hours to do but it's very well done, though, to get to get everything in that sort of perspective. You know, I think the rabbit's got big ears. <laughs> His ears are a bit long. <laughs> but I think you know she's got the bunch of flowers there, and it's just it's just beautiful. Now, Alice has closed eyes, so really. Here, the guide is drawing the group's attention to the rabbit in the painting and Alice, pointing out that Alice's eyes are closed, which is meant to be a reference to Charles Blackman's wife with her failing eyesight, and the rabbit with its large eye is Charles, the seeing side of the relationship. So he saw and she was led by him. It's a beautiful comment on their relationship. Just at this moment, one of the men in the group, who's standing at the back listening attentively, puts his hand on his wife's shoulder, who has younger onset dementia. She's seated in front of him, and he gives her this heartfelt squeeze, as if acknowledging the connection between Alice and the white rabbit in his relationship with his own wife. The tour wraps up and the group heads over to a few tables set with plenty of art supplies, paintbrushes, watercolors, pencils, fresh flowers, and small printouts of the paintings they saw today to inspire them to create their own artworks. This way they not only view art, but make art that they can reflect on later. It's really special. You, you um... When you're focusing on the art, there's nothing else. You're just in that moment. Uh, yeah. Whereas at home, you know, you're thinking of all other things you should be doing or whatever, but you're here for that dedicated hour and that's it. Okay, there we go. And um, that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation. And I've just got on the screen there 
um, information for those of you who might be interested about um, getting in touch with us or finding out more about the program. And um, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Debbie, and also uh, for Nancy for the introduction. Um, if you could both stick around, we might um, ask if anyone in the, that's joining us today would like to ask any questions. Um, if you'd like to do so, just a reminder, you can do so uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q and A button. So feel free to uh, put forward any questions you might have for Debbie or Nancy. Uh, I'll, I'll lead this off because there's a bit of a, a bit of a query about, um, firstly with Nancy, you mentioned the, the age friendly university. Are you able to explain a little bit further about what exactly that is and, and what else we can see in the future that will, that will show, showcase the impact of an age friendly university at the University of Queensland? Well, what we're hoping to accomplish is to continue some of the research that uh, Debbie highlighted during the talk by other museums. But GOMA ha or, uh, and uh, the Queensland Art Gallery, their program has been going for so long. They have such amazing learnings that we really wanna capture that empirically. We would like to write articles. And in fact, we have an article that we're starting to write now about the great adaptations uh, of this art and dementia program in the COVID environment. So we're really hoping to expand this. We're hoping also to expand the participants that are coming to the uh, gallery by partnering with uh, Metro North uh, Health Services. And finally, we part of being the age-friendly university is really having the voice of the older person come through. And so we'd like to do some work about what aspects of the program um, are most engaging or healthful or soothing to people and, and really try to amplify those. Um, so we're really pleased with this research collaboration. It fits so well within the Age-Friendly University Initiative. That's great. Thanks, uh, Nancy. Uh, Debbie, from your perspective, uh, what's, what's the future of the program you just showed us about? What's the future of the program for 2021, for example? Yeah, so as, as Nancy mentioned, during COVID, it gave us a chance to sort of stop and stand back and have a look and reflect. And um, at, at that point in time, um, we reached out to colleagues at the Prince Charles Hospital and um, Margie Morton and also Donna Pinska um, are, are great colleagues of, of, the, of, the, of the program or friends of our program. And um, they are running through their internal medicine and dementia research unit, they're, they're running drug trials for younger onset dementia patients. And so we figured that to support their well-being through this, this process, um, it would be great for, for those drug uh, patient uh, trial participants to come along and experience our program with their care partners. So we are, are really kind of broadening out to support um, these patients, but also at the same time, having Nancy and also uh, Teresa Scott from UQ on board so that we can possibly get some measuring as, as Nancy mentioned um, on how younger onset dementia um, participants um, can possibly improve their wellbeing and function through through tapping into a program like this. And um, additionally to that, you know, we've got our aged care residences back on, on board through the, the program bookings and our uh, day respite and community support groups, as well as our community program, which I have to say really exploded um, when we reopened in July, because I found whilst I kept in touch with so many of our, of our audience members while we were, we were closed, um, they were absolutely dying to come into a COVID safe environment and and get out of the house and have an, uh, an opportunity to, to come to the program. So we're running at the moment um, probably three times the number of community programs as we were, as we were before COVID. So it's a busy year ahead, Paul. Indeed. Thank you very much for that. I, I am mindful a little bit of time. Um, we've gone a little bit beyond where we'd normally go. So I might just quickly go through a couple of the questions that we've got coming through here. Um, and. I'll, I might let uh, Nancy, or actually Nancy and Debbie can both have an answer at this first one. The question the first comes saying, is there any data that suggests which participants are more likely to benefit from this program? For example, men or women, or people with tertiary education, or people that were already interested in the arts? Nancy, did you want to go first and then maybe let Debbie have a go from her perspective? The research shows actually that for all of these sorts of arts engagement programs that people from a wide variety of backgrounds can participate and really benefit. 
Yeah, that's that's right. And we don't find that um, those who have got an, are leaning towards art or or have tertiary background um, uh, or even somebody's job description really has any sort of um, difference in how people are engaging in our program. Uh, and also the other research is sort of telling us that people at early stage dementia and also those with later stage dementia um, are really able to, to still appreciate the handmade um, uh, representation in a painting and their, their aesthetic perception doesn't shift on this where it might if they're looking at photographs, for example, of a face. So very interesting. Great. What factors do you consider, Debbie, when choosing the art pieces that are involved in the program? That is a great question. Um, the barriers for us are that our operation is our gallery open seven days a week. So we're running a program through opening hours when a large number of museums around Australia and the world actually run their dementia programs on their day of closure. So environmental um, considerations are, are definitely important. So um, making sure that we've got a space where people with dementia can feel that they can hear but also not be overwhelmed by any kind of background activity. So that might mean um, moving into a space where there isn't a rotation of an artwork collection happening, uh, which can distract people. Then in terms of the artwork, um, it's very much about getting down at the level of where people with dementia will be viewing the work in the seated position. So looking at things like glare, uh, size of the work. Um, we know that um, Colours like red and blue and yellow are very easy for people with dementia to see. And that's not always a critical um, component, component in, in selecting the work, but it definitely helps. And the monochromatic sort of look, the, the, the grayscale works probably aren't as good to select. So it's about the colour. And then also, is there a narrative in that painting? If you get to know the biographies of people who are in the program, what is going to sing out to somebody and gain someone's attention? Um, so that we can engage more fully with that particular painting. And I think in the COVID days, we're looking for bigger scale works because we've got to spread out. So right now I'm, I'm really looking at those larger scale works so we can get the 1.5 between each group in the, in, the, in the program as we're viewing out as well. Great. We, we do have a couple more questions. What I might ask one more and then I might actually forward on some of the questions um, that you might be able to get back to people or people can actually contact the email address on the screen if you want to find out some more. Uh, but just quickly, uh, one that came through earlier was mentioning how that, um, an individual runs uh, therapy at uh, already with people with uh, mental disabilities or people for older demographics, whatever it may be. They, they want to know if there's any tips on encouraging people to try something more unique when it comes from an art perspective, or is it best just to let people do what they feel comfortable doing? Because obviously not everyone comes from a background where art is common to them. Now, I guess those that are a little bit more foreign to it, is there any tips to it? I think definitely, because we have this challenge as well, um, really looking at the person's biography and understanding something about their life or their personal experience or their previous occupation that they can find a trigger will then enable them through a tactile experience. Maybe there's an object that you can start with. I think museums could do this very well, objects that people can handle and then transferring that into some materiality, uh, whether that be um, crayon or paint or collage or images that you just rip from magazines and, um, and then I think taking those baby steps and making people feel comfortable because it's not everybody's cup of tea to, to create art, but they don't even realise what they're doing sometimes. And I think getting people in the moment and being able to focus um, on, on their intact ability and what they do have in terms of function uh, is really primarily your goal in whatever you do. Nancy, I think you were going to say something as well. I'll let you have a, a final word before we wrap up. My final word is that the beauty of these programs is that it's inspiring for all people. And the key here in this program, as with all programs, is to be unconditionally positive and supportive of everyone's efforts. And you really see the, the efforts of that um, gain dividends uh, when people participate. And that's why people are so keen to come back to the Art and Dementia program. And I'd really like to thank Debbie for giving us such an in-depth tour. It's like we were there. I've been there for the program and it was one of the best days uh, really participating in the program. So thank you very much. And thanks to Habs for having us. 
I, I'd like wow. to echo the thoughts to to thank Debbie once again for your time today. Also, thank you to Nancy and thank you to each of you who have joined us online today. Uh, we hope you found it informative and interesting. Uh, this is just one part of the HABS alumni webinar series. So HABS is the University of Queensland's Health and Behavioural Sciences. If you're interested in finding similar seminars or webinars, you can look that up online and it'll bring up some of the previous recordings. On that note, this one is being recorded as well, and we'll send out an email with the recording early next week um, to those of you with your email address. So once again, on a final word, thank you very much, Debbie. Thank you, Nancy, and I hope everyone has a lovely weekend.